Hi, everybody. Um, thanks a lot for joining us for this webinar. Um, as um, Rachel said, my name is Sharon Salvaggio, and I'm really excited about this opportunity to speak to a diverse group of landscape professionals and others across the country and in Oregon, where I live. And today, myself and my colleague, Emily May, will be speaking to you. Emily and I both work in the Xerces Society Pesticide Program, and Emily is also a pollinator conservation specialist so she also works in our pollinator program. Before we begin, um, let me tell a brief story. It was 2013 and I was just beginning to explore the widespread use of pesticides in natural lands management and agricultural sites. I was at the time particularly focused on water quality concerns because I worked at a national wildlife refuge and I wondered if the runoff from all the pesticide use both on and off the refuge could impact birds and the other species that we were trying to protect there. I was referred to Paul Jepson, professor of environmental toxicology at Oregon State University, and some of you may know him. He explained to me the assumptions and the many holes that are built into the pesticide regulatory process. And he helped me understand that for my particular concerns, which were waterfowl and native fish at the time, the fact that pesticides in use had been approved by the EPA didn't necessarily mean that the use of the pesticide would be safe. It was really an eye opener to me. And today, as we talk about pesticides and pollinators in the landscape, we hope that you'll come away with an enhanced understanding of the risks, as well as stronger skills in choosing solutions for pest management that can reduce your reliance on pesticides and reduce risk to pollinators. Now, you may be wondering who is the Xerces Society and why do we have such a strange name? Well, we were established in 1971 by Robert Michael Pyle, a unique thinker and author ahead of his time, really. He's written many books, some set in the Northwest and one called The Thunder Tree which is about his rich experience as a young boy growing up and playing near an irrigation ditch. It really illuminates how important semi-wild spaces are to people, especially suburban and urban dwellers who don't have access to fields and farms. Most of you uh, may work in these spaces or live in these spaces or in parks, residential landscapes. So thank you for all the work that you do in these spaces, which bring nature home to people more often than we realize. And the Xerces blue butterfly pictured here is our namesake. This little beauty, which was native to the San Francisco Bay Area, was the first US butterfly to go extinct due to human activities. The mission of the Xerces Society is all about protecting uh, invertebrates and their habitat. As you can see from this photo, invertebrates are a very diverse group. It means animals without vertebrae or um, more simply, animals that lack back backbones. It includes what we commonly call bugs. We're talking butterflies, bees, aquatic insects, which fish consume, mussels, beetles, insects like lacewings and ladybugs that provide natural pest control, and many more. Xerxes Society staff conduct on the ground conservation work. We focus on pollinator conservation conservation, improving agricultural biodiversity, endangered and declining species surveys and protection, and understanding and protecting against the risks of pesticides. We also have a new community engagement program focused on urban communities, parks, and college campuses called Bee City USA, Bee Campus USA. Please check out these programs and resources at our website at xerces.org. We don't do our work in isolation. We partner with scientists, agencies, farmers, companies, and community scientists. And none of this would be possible without our loyal members and donors. We welcome anybody to become a member or donor at our website. So how do you manage parks and natural areas in a way that recognizes the role of pollinators in these systems avoids risks from the use of pesticides and practices proactive pest management solutions. We'll tackle that bit by bit today. First, we'll go over pesticide issues related to pollinators and their habitat. We'll then review pesticide risk concepts. These are important concepts to understand and will help you think how to minimize risk in your work later. 
We'll then discuss how the pesticide regulation process works and how pesticides are tested to figure out risk for bees. We want you to have a better understanding about what information gets collected, what assumptions are made, what information is left out. Again, knowing this is helpful later when you're trying to evaluate whether or not to use a pesticide. We'll talk about where and how to look for risk clues on the label and understanding common claims used in marketing terminology as well. I'll then segue to Emily May with a pragmatic focus on solutions. She'll talk about how you can think through the natural system that is resulting in the pest issue. How do you understand the pest pressure relative to your tolerance for it? What's involved in choosing non-chemical strategies? If you do use pesticides, what are the high risk scenarios and how do you mitigate risk? Then Emily will finish up with a few examples that will be relevant in Oregon and potentially elsewhere. And then we'll have time at the end for an open question and answer period. Again, if you have joined this webinar and want the recertification credits from Oregon, um, you'll need to stay through the entire webinar, including the question and answer period and answer the polls. Let's start out by recognizing the bee. It's an insect that is co-evolved with flowering plants and it's a match made in heaven. Bees make sure flowering plants can reproduce, flowering plants make sure bees can eat. In the meantime, the synergy produces a third of our food and keeps 85% of native plants going, including those important native plants in our natural areas that reproduce by seed. Pollination makes possible the production of fruits and seeds. The seeds and fruits from these native flowering plants are food sources for many other types of wildlife, from birds to mammals. Through the simple act of moving pollen from flower to flower, pollinators help build out the base of the food chain for many species. And they are also part of that base themselves. About nine in 10 bird species eat insects as a protein source at some point in their lives. Pound for pound, insects actually contain more than twice as much protein as beef. Importantly, habitat that supports pollinators also provides habitat for beneficial species that eat or parasitize insects. This is called conservation biological control, recognizing that nature controls pests through the food chain. By supporting healthy habitat for pollinators, we support the natural enemies that eat or parasitize pests. Many natural enemies also consume pollen so adding flowers for bees also lays the groundwork for a healthy population of natural enemies who will control pests. This photo is of a crab spider consuming a fly. Now, most people have seen and heard about the honeybee, which is actually not a native species in the Americas, but it is a major crop pollinator and source of honey. Beyond the honeybee, did you know that there are about 3,600 species of native bees in the United States and Canada? And about 200 species, native bee species, just in the Willamette Valley of Oregon? This photo gives you a bit of insight into the great diversity of the size of bees in our midst. Many of our native bees, like this tiny Perdita bee, are very small, move quickly, and are hard to see. Here, the Perdita is juxtaposed against the head of the much larger Xylocopa, also called the large carpenter bee. Honeybees have had a lot of trouble in the last decade, but they are not the only ones. 40% of invertebrate pollinators may actually be at risk of extinction. This photo shows Bombus affinis, rusty patch bumblebee, which is a Midwestern species, which is on the endangered species list. Pollinators and other insects are threatened by key stressors, including habitat loss, climate change, disease and invasives, and pollution. Pesticide pollution in particular is considered one of the primary drivers of insect decline. A billion pounds of pesticides are applied each year in the US from ag land to home landscapes and parks, natural areas, along roads, railways, and more. If that number seems incomprehensible, think of it this way. That's 263 pounds of pesticide on each square mile in the country each year. 
This is a huge stressor to insects and other invertebrates. But those pesticides are considered safe by the EPA, right? So how exactly do pesticides create risk for pollinators? Most of us have been conditioned to think that insects are gross and that the only good insect is a dead insect. So you might be thinking, we need those pesticides to deal with all those bugs. Those are a real problem. Huh, well, what a lot of people don't realize is just how few insects actually are considered pests. In other words, species that actually threaten human economic outputs or human health. What percent of insect species do you think are not actually pests. So this is the first quiz to test engagement. So Rachel, can you bring up the poll? Okay, please respond by clicking on the polling button with your answer and I'll wait for about 15 seconds. Okay, I'm going to go to the answer, which most of you got right. Here's the results, can you see them? 98% is the correct answer. 98% of insects are vital for maintaining food webs, decomposing dead things, or conducting natural pest control only 2% of insect species are considered pests. When pesticides are incorporated into urban management practices, we need to consider the repercussions on other organisms, not just the pests. In fact, pesticides, which includes insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides, are implicated in a number of effects to bees. For instance, we've had many well-publicized events of pesticides directly causing death to thousands or even millions of individual bees, even in urban areas, such as the kill of 50,000 bumblebees in Wilsonville, Oregon, that happened seven years ago, or the more recent mosquito spraying that killed millions of honeybees in the Southeast. While we often think of insecticides as the main culprit in impacts to bees, Indirect effects such as using herbicides to eliminate low weeds in lawns also have an effect on populations. Let's look at a few terms that are important as we consider the impact of pesticides. First, target pest. This is the pest an applicator is trying to reach. As you can see here, the guy standing is spraying directly into the lake. I'm guessing he's trying to get herbicide on some kind of aquatic invasive weed. What else do you think that he might be contacting? Well, probably anything else that the pesticide reaches. That's called exposure. Probably some good native plants, invertebrates that live in the lake that are food for fish. Possibly even he might be contacting fish too with the pesticide. We would call all of those non-targets. Not what the pesticide was meant to reach, but of course it did. The pesticide may even have reached some flowering weeds on the shore that bees visit. Pesticides detected in the environment are called residues. Non-target exposure to residues is one of the reasons why pollinators are affected by pesticides. Now, pesticide residues have been detected just about everywhere that anyone looks including in Arctic snow samples. Closer to home, pesticides are routinely found in flowers and the leaves of pollinated plants, honeybees, their hives, soils, rivers and streams, etc. In many, if not most of these samples, we see multiple pesticide residues commingling. This shows up in samples as what people call multiple detections. For example, honeybee hives frequently have dozens of pesticides these are found in the bees themselves and their honey and wax and something called bee bread, which is food that the, the workers feed on. The problem of pesticide residues is not limited to agricultural areas. A recent study that examined residues in milkweeds, for example, found 15 pesticides in one plant growing in an urban environment. 
And rivers and streams carry a lot of pesticide pollution. In urban areas, urban streams and rivers can be more polluted than rivers going through agricultural areas. In fact, 90% of urban rivers and streams contain pesticides at levels toxic to aquatic life, according to data collected routinely by the US Geological Survey. Of course, what applicators want is for the pesticide to contact the pest and do its work. But often a surprisingly low percentage actually does reach the pest with the rest moving off target. Physical forces, wind, water, and heat, these carry residues off target. So bees and other pollinators are really the target of a pesticide application, but because of the movement of pesticides, the habitat of bees can be exposed. Think about how a bee feeds and reproduces. Bees fly around um, fly, finding flowers so that they can collect pollen and nectar for food. While foraging, they can get sprayed directly as shown in this first graphic to the far left. They can also pick up contaminated pollen and nectar from flowers that were previously sprayed as shown in the second graphic. We also need to think about how they reproduce. Our native bees are different from the honeybee. They don't build a hive. Some bees collect pieces of leaves for their nests. Other bees nest in the ground. So if the leaf pieces they, they collect for their nests or the soil where they nest are contaminated, that could mean exposure as shown in the two graphics to the right. One thing to keep in mind is that wild native bee larvae are much more exposed to pesticide residues and pollen because they consume unprocessed pollen. Honey bee larvae eat pollen that has been processed through the guts of other bees in the hive. So pesticide residues have more of a chance to break down through that process. So wild native bees, which don't eat pollen, which has been processed, may be more vulnerable to the effects of pesticide residues and pollen than honey bees. The, the key point of these graphics here is that to keep in mind that even if bees are not around when the exposure occurs or when the application occurs, exposure can occur through roots two, three, and five. In the middle, plants can absorb pesticides through soil, which means that pollen and nectar can get contaminated through that. Okay, so maybe you're thinking, come on, we hardly spray like the way we saw in that photo a couple of slides back. New tools like soil drenches, uh, granules, and tree or stem injection, all shown here, give us the opportunity to apply pesticides in a very targeted way. And it's true that these newer methods eliminate the problem of drift or wind carrying pesticides away. There's just one problem for pollinators with these methods. Pesticides applied with soil drenches, granules, and injection, as illustrated here, are absorbed directly into the plant vascular system and move systemically upward within plants. Frequently, the systemic movement means that the pesticide makes its way to leave nectar and pollen. At that point, anything that feeds upon that plant is going to get a dose of the pesticide. The only details are whether that animal gets enough of the pesticide to matter and whether that animal is insensitive to the pesticide. So these kinds of systemic applications also put at risk bees, the caterpillars of butterflies and moths, and those other natural enemies that we talked about earlier that also feed on pollen and nectar. And when the pesticide is known to be persistent, this means there is an exposure period for a long time. Neonicotinoids, which you may have heard of, are systemic insecticides, and many other insecticides and fungicides and herbicides are also systemic. And some of the insecticides and fungicides cause particular concern for bees. Let's move now to better understand the regulatory system for pesticides. In the United States, the EPA implements FIFRA, which is a law that governs the registration, distribution, sale, and use of pesticides. Registration, which allows the sale and use of a pesticide, lasts 15 years and occurs after EPA considers the pesticide's risk. So what is risk exactly? Well, in this context, it means the likelihood and the magnitude of an adverse effect as a result of exposure to a pesticide. Ultimately, in the United States, the EPA considers risk acceptable if the benefit, such as 
economic benefit to society is thought to outweigh the cost or the risk. When I say cost, I mean risk in a larger sense, not just economic cost. Now, by contrast, the European Union has explicitly adopted the precautionary principle, which means that protection of health takes precedence over economic considerations. And if there are uncertainties about risk, the proponent of having the pesticide registered, which would be the pesticide registrant or the manufacturer, must bear the burden of proof that it is not harmful rather than the public. This doesn't mean that pesticides never get approved in the European Union, but do note the difference in the legal standard. So I've used this word risk several times now. We defined it as the likelihood and the magnitude of an adverse effect from exposure. How does EPA figure out risk? Let's look at a little exercise. If a radioactive spill happens on the moon and your chance of exposure is zero, what is the risk? If you can figure it out, nice work. I think we have another poll here, right, uh, Rachel? Yeah, I can pull that up for you. Okay. Sharon, if you, you might wanna double check or leave a little bit more time I, um, to make sure if, if someone didn't get finished the poll last time, there were still a few answers coming in when you closed it. If someone didn't get their answer, please put your name in the Q&A or maybe we can restart it. I don't know, Rachel or Sharon, if you have another idea for that. Thanks, Ame. We'll follow through on that afterwards and I'll, I'll leave more time this time. Thank you, Amay, and thank you, Sharon. So I'll go ahead and launch the second poll. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling. And I'm going to show the results. Most of you got it right. Nobody will die or get hurt. And I'm gonna explain why. Uh, if you said nobody would die or get hurt, you're right. But it's not because radioactivity isn't deadly, it is. Risk is influenced by the hazard or the toxicity of a chemical. And we all know that radioactivity is highly toxic, but risk expands, depends also upon exposure, or how much of it you get. We already know that radioactivity is highly hazardous, but there's probably not going to be any exposure to you if the spill happens on the moon. Therefore, even though the hazard is high, exposure is zero, so the risk is zero. So this is a little bit simplistic as indirect effects can occur in space or time, even to species that aren't exposed themselves. Before we move on, you may be wondering about this photo. It's an abandoned doll at the Chernobyl site being measured for radioactivity. The authorities evacuated all the residents of this area for good to reduce their exposure. Hence the risk of mortality or developing serious side effects. I use this photo just to illustrate the concept. So we've talked a lot about exposure or the chance that a non-target is going to pick up some of the pesticide. And that depends upon how much exposure occurs, what the method of exposure is and how long the exposure lasts. The other main concept to consider in risk is hazard, often call, called toxicity. How toxic is it? When a bee is exposed to a pesticide, the outcome might be lethal or it might be sublethal. And how do those differ? Well, a lethal, result, a lethal result ends with mortality or death. And a sublethal result is when death doesn't occur, but a different adverse outcome does occur. A useful principle in toxicology is the dose makes the poison. In other words, 
The higher the dose or the mo more prolonged the, expo the exposure, all else being equal, the more severe the outcome. In addition, the more hazardous the chemical, all else being equal, the more severe the outcome. So essentially, you raise exposure, you raise hazard. Either way, you're more likely to have an adverse outcome. Now, there's a lot of experimental evidence that backs up this paradigm, and there's some limits and shortcomings as well. So let's look at how toxicologists investigate hazard and exposure by testing chemicals to understand how risky a pesticide might be. First, toxicologists look at the method of exposure or about how the organism picks up the pesticide. Let's say you were out spraying some weed killer while out doing a restoration project. Could you pick it up by getting it on your skin? Yes. By consuming food or water while you're eating your lunch that might have gotten sprayed by mistake, or maybe you transferred it from your hands to your sandwich? Yes. Or by breathing it in? Yes. These methods, contact, oral, and respiration are the primary methods by which wildlife can also be exposed. And for an insect, this contact exposure is sometimes, sometimes called dermal exposure, topical, would occur on its cuticle. The upper photo here shows how contact exposure is simulated in a lab by dropping a solution of pesticide on the thorax of a bee. The lower photo shows how oral exposure is simulated in the lab by providing a hive with a contaminated feeding solution. Note that the species in both photos is a European honeybee. The results from tests on this non-native insect are used to evaluate risk for all other species. And believe it or not, excuse me, all other bees, and believe it or not, the risk for all other terrestrial insects, which I think is a little crazy and maybe you do too. The honeybee is a very important species, but we have 91,000 terrestrial insects that it's expected to stand in for. Also, the honeybee has a very different life history than bees native to the Americas, as I mentioned previously. So remember, most species out there in our forests, fields, and streams don't have a large body of lab testing pertaining to them. And so the inferences made by about how pesticides in the environment might affect them based upon what's reported in standardized tests on the honeybee may or may not be that accurate. Let's look at exposure. The duration of exposure is, is pretty important. In testing, the duration time is usually separated into two categories, acute and chronic. The exposure time for an acute test is a one time or a very brief dose as shown in red on the chart. Like that contact test shown in the previous slide, that one involves a one-time drop of pesticide solution applied to the backside of a bee. It's followed by two to four days of observation specifically looking for mortality. Chronic exposure means one that's ongoing or with continuous exposure through the, through the period. For bees, this is tested by allowing bees to feed from contaminated feeding solution for 10 days. The bees are observed throughout the duration of the 10-day exposure. Researchers are especially looking for sublethal effects such as behavioral or movement changes. To understand how long exposure might occur in the real world, EPA also requires data on the time it takes for a pesticide to break down, usually in soil. This is an important property to examine in considering risk in the environment because when you think about it, the more persistent a pesticide is, the higher the likelihood is that it will expose a non-target organism. Pesticides do break down eventually, but the amount of time varies a lot, depending upon the chemical and whether the residue is in soil, plants, or water. The breakdown time is called persistence, and it's measured by a metric called half-life. Each half-life causes the residue left to decline by half. Don't confuse the half-life with the time that exposure could occur. After one half-life, only 50% is gone. It takes another half-life to get down to 25% of the original amount. And as you can see, it takes more than five half-lives for a pesticide to be present at negligible amounts. For a pesticide with a half-life of 15 days, which is considered non-persistent, by the way, it would take about 90 days until it's basically gone. 
Think about that compared to the short life cycle of many bees. Also, when we refer to the percent that remains, that means a decrease in concentration. For a very highly toxic pesticide where the concentration could still be enough, even if only 6% of its original concentration, we might still be concerned. Rates of degradation or breakdown can vary quite a bit based on the medium that the residue is in, for instance, soil, water, or plant, as well as the temperature, moisture, pH, and even the original dose of concentration. Okay, so those are the basic concepts of exposure. Let's look at toxicity now. So let's pretend you're a lab scientist and you're excited about a new chemical discovery that you've made that just might keep aphids from bothering your trees. You want to see just how toxic this chemical might be to wildlife. You've decided to test bees so you get some healthy two-day-old adult worker honeybees because these are the standard test organism for bees. You want to know what concentration results in effects. Specifically, will any concentration kill the bees? If so, which concentration? And if bees do die at a certain concentration, how many of them will die? All of them? Some of them? So you dissolve your new chemical and sugar solution at several different dilutions. Pesticides are often tested in very dilute concentrations such as part per million or parts per billion, which is the PPB that you see on this slide. Here you're running the test with one part per billion all the way up to 100 parts per billion. You also have one container with just sugar solution in it, no pesticide, that's your control. So you set up four cages and you put each dilution in a different cage. And then you put 10 honeybees in each cage, let them eat, eat up the spiked sugar solution and replace it with regular unspiked food for the remainder of the test. And then you watch what happens for 48 hours. Notice that you've kept the amount of time the bees are exposed and the method of exposure constant between all of your cages. All you're changing up is the concentration. You wanna know at which concentration do half of them die while the other half live. Let's say that you found out that at 10 parts per billion, 50% of the bees died. You've just arrived at the most widely used metric in ecotoxicology abbreviated as LV50 or LC50, it's the dose or concentration that results in 50% of the test population dying under a short-term or acute exposure. This is also known as the median lethal dose. So 50% die and 50% live. That means your LC50 in this test is 10 parts per billion. So that's really exciting. You figured that out. Now you publish your results, you call that chemical pretty posy, and then you discover another promising chemical in the lab. You run the same test. This time you find that it takes 50 parts per billion to make 50% of the bees die. Hmm. You decide to call this chemical bad boy. So comparing the two chemicals, which is more acutely toxic to bees? Rachel, can you figure, I mean, can you cue up the next polling question? Okay, once again, when bees are exposed to bad boy insecticide at 50 parts per billion, 50% 50 of them die. And when bees are exposed to pretty posy at 10 parts per billion, 50% of them die. Which insecticide is more acutely toxic? I have to say, I'm really impressed with you guys as a group. You're doing extremely well on these polling questions. Couple more seconds and I'll end the poll. Okay, I'm gonna show the results. And if you came up with pretty posy, you're right. Good job. Basically, you can think about this as the less it takes to kill you, the more toxic it is. And just one tip, 
Uh, don't be deceived by the name. Pesticides are sold under all kinds of bizarre names. Mm, my screen, okay, there we go. Now, what happened to the bees that didn't die? Did any of them exhibit any other effects? Maybe some of them stopped flying or got strange growths. These would be examples of sublethal results. They didn't die after exposure, but something else observable happened. Sublethal effects include things like this, such as decreased growth, fewer offspring, a change in navigational ability, or a change in learning ability, and a lot of other things can be tested as well. Now, it's easy to slip into the mindset if it don't kill you, it ain't a problem. Or even what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But don't slip into the mindsets because sublethal effects such as reduced growth or lower egg production can make a difference. My um, computer is not allowing me to advance. There it goes. Okay. So another aspect of toxicity is selectivity. A broad spectrum or non-selective pesticide harms a wide range of species. If each polka dot is a different kind of insect, a broad spectrum insecticide would wipe out all or nearly all of them on the left. This means broad spectrum active ingredients are also likely to kill a wide range of non-targets. Examples of broad spectrums that are widely used among people working in the landscape sector include glyphosate-based herbicides such as Roundup. On the insecticide side, pyrethroids such as bifenthrin or neonicotinoids such as those containing imidacloprid are also broad spectrum. On the right, a selective pesticide would harm fewer species. For example, only the green dots would be wiped out, leaving the rest. Even a selective active ingredient can target quite a large group though, having significant effects. For example, some of you may know about the active ingredient dicamba, which has been at the center of a huge controversy over the last few years. Dicamba is considered a selective herbicide because it kills broadleaf plants or dicots, which happen to be the flowering plants that are not grasses. This is actually quite a large group of plant. But if you've been following the news, you've heard that dicamba is responsible for a huge amount of plant injury in the South and the Midwest over the last several years because it evaporates very easily into the air drifting away from the application site and impacting off-site farms and habitats. So again, even though some people call it a selective herbicide, it can be very damaging. So in thinking about what we've just learned regarding standardized testing, exposure, toxicity, and all of that, we can recognize some shortcomings. Overall, as you've probably noticed, since the parameter of standardized tests need to be set so strictly, Standardized tests can really only be partially reflective of the real world. Standardized tests are conducted on the active ingredient that is um, listed on the pesticide label and typically one chemical at a time. But in the real world, applicators routinely tank mix products and we know that pesticide contaminants, as we talked about at the very beginning, are typically found as mixtures in the environment when we remember what we talked about with milkweeds, beehives, and streams. So wildlife were actually exposed to multiple pesticides as the norm rather than the exception. So standardized testing mostly ignores this reality. In addition, standardized testing looks at limited outcomes. While just about any effect can actually be tested, in reality, standardized testing relies on a few easily measured variables, mortality, weight, food consumption, number of progeny, et cetera. You have to look to the scientific literature to find a more robust set of outcomes explored. And the tests for bees have also been slow to address the reality that invertebrates have different life stages, eggs, larva, often pupa, um, and adult. And are eggs and larva more sensitive? Stand larvae, I should say, standardized testing is only starting to include tests on larval bees, for, for instance. Finally, as we discussed before, standardized tests are conducted on one species for insects, considered representative for thousands of other insects. 
So the honeybee is a surrogate for the 91,000 species of other terrestrial insects in the US. It's a tall charge, not likely to give us a truly representative view of risk to all the important insects out there that we, we know are out there and that we talked about at the beginning. For example, how do we know that native bees are not more sensitive to pesticides than honeybees? Well, we don't actually have a lot of data to really know, but there is some data in a recent review of 150 studies revealed that other bees shows, showed a higher sensitivity to pesticides than the honeybee in about 35% of the cases. The bee pictured here, which is a ground nesting minor bee native to Eastern North America known as the trout lily bee was the most sensitive species in the studies examined. One thing that standardized pesting uh, does give us is um, an ability to compare pesticides. Um, and this is one benefit from standardized testing. For, if, for instance, the results from many different studies and experiments can, can be compared one to another because the methodology is so strict, apples to apples. This helps us, for instance, excuse me, this helps us, for instance, to compare LD50 values and figure out which pesticides result in mortality at the lowest concentrations. Using that data, we know that insecticides are the majority of chemicals that are included in toxicity group one, the most likely to be lethal at lower concentrations. Um, the EPA requires certain cautionary statements on the label and you may have seen these on pesticide labels. If you're using a pesticide with a precautionary statement that says this product is highly toxic, you've got a pesticide that is likely to result in mortality if bees are around or if they pick up the pesticide after the spray. But remember, risk is about more than toxicity. It's also about exposure. And while insecticides pose the most obvious hazard or toxicity to pollinators, other types of pesticides do present risk. Fungicides are typically the most abundant pesticide found in bumblebee and honeybee hives. That means that there's the greater exposure to fungicides compared to other types of pesticides. And part of the concern with fungicides is that some of them interact synergistically with certain insecticides. You can think of this as multiplying the toxicity compared with just adding it together. Some scientists are pointing to losses in the abundance of wild bees in areas with, with more fungicides and a reduced ability for bees to fight off disease when they, they've been exposed to fungicides. So we do see harm to bees from fungicides, even though for a long time, the EPA has classified them, most of them as practically non-toxic to bees. And so this demonstrates the complexity of ecosystems and the challenges of understanding risk. Risk isn't based only on toxicity classification listed on a product label. That is in part why we promote longer term solutions to reduce the need for pesticides. And Emily May will be talking more about those solutions in a few minutes. Now let's look at herbicides for a minute. These are of course widely used in landscapes to kill weedy plants and in the case of pre-emergent herbicides to prevent plant um, germination. A few herbicides do have lethal impacts, including one known as paraquat. Other herbicides have been shown to cause sublethal effects, including changes to gut microbiomes of honeybees. Some scientists believe these gut microbiome changes make bees more vulnerable to diseases. Other effects tied to herbicides include changes in feeding or changes in navigation behavior. In addition to these direct risks, we keep in mind the largest impact of herbicides, which is that herbicides basically eliminate the habitat, not just for pollinators, but also for just about every other terrestrial insect. For example, some scientists believe that the dire situation of the once common monarch butterfly, shown here as a caterpillar, is due at least in part to the dramatic increase of herbicides in Midwest crop fields. The monarch is so diminished that it is now a candidate for the endangered species list. That's a different story, but it helps illustrate why herbicides are still something to avoid whenever possible. So circling back to how pesticides are regulated, as we mentioned earlier, the data collected about pesticides feeds into the regulatory process and results in a registration decision 
and ultimately the label, which specifies directions about how pesticides can be used. The pesticide label is first and foremost, a set of instructions to the applicator about how to use the product. As many of you know, the label is the law. The only problem is it's so darn hard for most of us to interpret the label, even to know what we should avoid. For example, signal words. Signal words are those words in all caps usually found at the bottom of a pesticide label. You might see the word caution as shown on both of these examples, warning, danger, or possibly no word at all. I've worked with parks applicators who think that they're doing everything right because they only use pesticides with a signal word of caution. But this doesn't mean that the pesticide has no risk to pollinators. That's because signal words are based upon tests on mammals, typically lab rats. Signal, word, signal words only indicate the potential for mammalian toxicity under acute exposure. They're meant to draw attention to those pesticides that may pose elevated risk to humans under a brief exposure scenario. Only bat pollinators are man, mammals. The rest of the pollinators and the really key ones, bees, are not mammals. Because the biology of insects and mammals is often quite different, obviously you can't draw conclusions from a signal word about the safety of a pesticide to pollinators that has a caution word on the, as a signal word. So please don't make the mistake of thinking pesticides labeled with caution are not a problem for bees. For example, the label shown on the top right contains uh, two pyrethroid insecticides, which are very highly toxic to bees. But the label says caution because these chemicals are not very acutely toxic to mammals. All that said, signal words are important for your own health and the health of the people who use the spaces that you're managing. And you should definitely consider whether use is warranted and justified by considering risk to people as well as pollinators whenever looking at your options with a pest issue. Minimizing use of all pesticides is really the best way to protect bees. But if you must use a pesticide, learning to read a pesticide label is an important thing. You can make decisions by interpreting the label. This graphic was put together by uh, scientists at the Oregon Bee Project. It's helpful and it teaches people how to interpret what may appear to be very minor differences in words. Let, let's walk through it, there's five steps. Step one tells you to open the label and look for the environmental hazards section. This may seem obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people use pesticides without reading the label. So be responsible, read the label, figure out what some of the risks are before you apply. Step two tells you whether a product is toxic or highly toxic to bees. If you see this, this means that the pesticide is toxic enough that it could kill bees if they visited a flower or were touched by the spray. If you must use any of these pesticides, don't spray and bloom, not until all the petals have fallen. Step three, remember a few minutes ago when I talked about persistence? Step three talks about this. This one's a lot more difficult to interpret because EPA for whatever reason really doesn't use great words to differentiate or explain what it really means. But the people at the Oregon Bee Project have explained here that if it says foraging or visiting, rather than actively foraging or actively visiting, it, it is basically a difference in the persistence of the pesticide. Uh, foraging or visiting is um, basically more persistent than actively foraging or actively visiting. Um, Oregon Bee Project um, tells people only apply in the evening when bees are not active, if it says actively foraging or actively visiting. Our advice is more conservative than that. Um, and Emily May will, will talk about other ways to address pest issues, but I did want you to, you to have this particular information. You may see on some pesticides in step four, the bee advisory box, um, and then there's the use directions. Let's go to the next slide where we'll talk about the bee advisory box a little bit. Now, EPA be began requiring um, this bee hazard icon um, about six years ago for certain pesticides. It's an improvement, but we want you to know that we don't think it's adequate on its own 
That's because the icon is only on labels for the most toxic neonicotinoids and only when those products are registered for outdoor folio use. In other words, when they're sprayed. Um, granulars are excluded. In addition, they're designed to warn people about the acute risks um, and about mortality risk, not sublethal or chronic risks that might still lead to population declines. But this is a problem from our perspective because as many of the pesticides, most of the news do act through sublethal methods that reduce bees foraging capability, their learning capability, their navigational ability and so on, ultimately having population level results. So bee boxes by themselves are not the answer. Knowing ways to limit the risk when using pesticides is important and Emily May will discuss more on this in her section. So to wrap up my presentation here that is focused on um, understanding pesticide risks, the regulatory system and label language, please think about this. Going back to what I said at the very beginning, once a pesticide is on the market, many people assume that it's safe. For example, look at this statement from an industry organization after a county in Maryland approved a local policy to permit only organic or minimum risk pesticides on public or private turf. The industry group RISE was basically saying that the policy was unnecessary, that if a product is approved by the EPA, then it's scientifically proven to be safe. Now, it's an easy mistake to make, but given everything that I've just talked about, and hopefully you've learned about safety, safety is not a bright line in the pesticide approval process. Remember, if the benefits are considered high enough in terms of food supply or economic benefits, even high acknowledged risks to the environment or even people are, to are tolerated under a current system. And remember too, all the gaps in the process, uncertainty is always present. Now EPA knows this and has policy about characterizing uncertainty, but the general public usually doesn't understand the limits on what we really know about risk. Because there's most, both risk and uncertainty about the impacts of pesticides to pollinators and other invertebrates, Xerxes Society consistent, consistently teaches that relying on pesticides as a defense against pests is a last resort, not a first line of defense. The good news, there are solutions to pest management issues. My colleague, Emily May, will start now and she'll talk about how you can go about thinking through your pest issues and implementing better solutions so that um, you can reduce your reliance on pesticides. Emily May is a real dynamo on our team. She is young and incredibly talented for such a young person with a background in both integrated pest management um, in agriculture and um, entomology. She received her master's from Michigan State University studying a pest that we have here in the Northwest, the dreaded spotted wing Drosophila. I always learn something from Emily May's presentations, and I think you're going to enjoy her style and the way she makes ecologically based solutions to pest management so approachable. With that, take it away, Emily May. Emily May. Thanks so much, Sharon. And thank you for calling me young. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, what can you see? Are you seeing um, my presentation? Yeah, it looks good, Emily. Okay, great, thanks. So thanks, Sharon. My name's Emily May. I'm a pollinator conservation specialist with the Xerces Society's pesticide program. So I'm picking up uh, part two of this presentation to offer some solutions and strategies for managing pests while protecting pollinators, keeping everything that we have learned uh, from Sharon in mind. So let's talk, start by talking about a positive vision because our ultimate goal is really to help both urban and agricultural areas realize the potential for successful pollinator conservation, which includes building high quality habitat for pollinators and then taking steps to protect that habitat from pesticides, including insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. So to start, uh, let's go back to sort of the beginning of Sharon's presentation and just briefly mention what pollinators need as a reminder. They need food or flowering resources. They need shelter, places to nest and protection from pesticides. 
So this is all the base of the pyramid for pollinator protection. You need healthy habitat. And then to keep it healthy, you need to protect it from contamination. I know Sharon already mentioned this and even tested you on it, but uh, it seemed worth mentioning again that the vast majority of insects are directly actually beneficial to humans or otherwise foundational in our natural ecosystems. And less than 2% of insect species are what we might consider pests. Even, um, even those can sometimes be beneficial as many pest species are food sources for other insects um, and some low level of, of pest species can support natural enemies. Uh, thinking beyond insects, it's helpful to consider more deeply what a pest is. What do we consider pests? Um, a lot of times we consider pest uh, species uh, when they compete with humans for resources, like a gypsy moth that defoliates forest trees or uh, a weed that outcompetes a food crop, something like that. Uh, enemies like those that can transmit diseases. So things like rats and mosquitoes and ticks that can carry diseases that affect humans. And then there's kind of that nuisance organism, which is things that we don't really like, but they don't actually cause real harm or damage, which is something like ants in the picnic uh, shelter that you, you've gone out to enjoy your picnic in. Um, so there's a whole spectrum here and some of those things need management and other things might not. So a lot of urban pesticide use, including in parks, is aimed at keeping our landscapes looking nice, which is a laudable goal, but we would uh, encourage in individuals and municipalities to rethink using pesticides only for aesthetic reasons, including in some cases the use of herbicides to deal with weeds that are really only a cosmetic issue. Um, so for example, a lot of parks districts use pre-emergent herbicides on ornamental beds to manage weeds emerging from seeds in the soil, which is an example of a use that could be replaced with a preventive practice like mulching in some cases. So many annual weeds are, are easily controlled with the right mulch application. Um, and if more difficult perennial weeds are able to push through, that's when you might consider a secondary practice like hand weeding or spot treatments. Sort of beyond that, we see a lot of communities and individuals actually sort of evolving their aesthetic around cosmetics, moving beyond manicured lawns and turf and boxwoods to a more sort of rewilded urban space. But that's really a whole separate talk. And I'm sure that someone at Xerxes will give it at some point, but you're here for an IPM education. So let's talk about integrated pest management uh, as a framework that centers pollinator protection. So integrated pest management or IPM is a framework for approaching pest management. Um, and, and really what we're talking about here is centering this framework around preventive practices as the foundation of preventive based IPM for pollinators. Um, by reducing food, water, or shelter for insect pests, for diseases, for weeds, and making sure that you're, the plants that you really want are well nourished and supported, they can defend themselves and you can keep those pests better in hand. So prevention is the first step. Um, the other part of IPM is integrating cultural, mechanical, and biological controls. So cultural controls are, are practices that reduce pest survival, reproduction, or establishment um, by enhancing desired conditions. Um, so that, that means making sure plants are getting appropriate water and nutrients, pruning plants to remove uh, foliage that gets infect, infested, and then hand weeding. Um, mechanical control is physical methods or mechanical equipment um, removing or excluding pests. So things like mowing, uh, hand removal, hand picking insects or weeds, and then using barriers or traps or row covers if you're an ag. Biological controls um, can be, there's a whole spectrum of sort of what would be considered biological controls, but it's, you know, things like uh, lady beetles and lace wings that um, can be used for pest control. And then 
the very tip top of this uh, this is chemical controls. So chemical control is really a last resort in this framework, only when a pest has exceeded a threshold of damage um, where it's really posing a problem and other Whoa! strategies uh, have been exhausted or aren't feasible. Sorry about that. My dog's enemy is going by the house right now, I think. <laughs> um, so lots of examples of preventive strategies um, include putting the right plants in the right place, building healthy soils and that good foundation for supporting uh, a healthy habitat and protecting biodiversity. Building that resilient ecosystem in a yard or garden, in a park or restoration planting starts with a foundation of planning and design. So paying special attention to the microclimate of the site um, and choosing the right plants for that place spacing them out so that they receive good sunlight and airflow um, and building healthy soils. Uh, and all of that put together gives you that sort of base of, of resilience. But problems can arise, unfortunately, even in the most well-planned areas. Um, <laughs> so I'm not providing uh, in this presentation specific management advice on specific pests. I will get into a couple of different examples. Um, but I am going to go through sort of the general framework you can use when problems do arise, when something has come up that you are needing to deal with. A lot of times uh, pest issues that do come up are the symptom of a problem rather than the problem itself. Uh, so often pests are affecting plants that are already stressed out um, or where we've accidentally created conditions that help pests or weeds thrive, like accidentally over-fertilizing um, a native planting and, and really shuttling resources right to uh, annual weeds that can ha harness those resources better than the native perennials in that planting. So rather than treating the pest itself, uh, a good way to start is to identify kind of the underlying issue and make changes and also to intervene as early as possible. So if you notice that something is diseased, cutting it out and disposing it, disposing of it in a way that minimizes spread. Um, so an example of, of what I'm talking about here is powdery mildew, which is something that affects a lot of ornamental and garden plants. And it's likely to come back even if you treat it with a pesticide, a fungicide. So instead, increasing airflow, making sure that you have the have removed sort of the conditions that allow powdery mildew to thrive. Um, some of those other causes could be, yeah, overwatering, insufficient airflow, over fertilizing. Um, if you can remove those sort of underlying conditions, your plants are less likely to suffer from this particular disease. So knowing what your pests need to survive is going to help you identify the best ways to address them. The principles of this framework are something that can be implemented in a whole bunch of different scales and a whole bunch of different environments from your backyard to city parks, uh, greenhouses, forests and natural areas. Um, and it's, it's something that we're trying to help people apply in all, all different kinds of spaces just by giving you the, the sort of steps and tools and resources to be able to, to do it at those different scales. So let's go through some of the steps for IPM. The first step is knowing the insects, diseases, or weeds that you're dealing with and their biology. This is really critical. So you might be observing damage on a plant but not know what's causing it. So how can you work to prevent that damage if you don't know what the pest is or its biology? Um, so the first step is really critical, figuring out what you're dealing with and learning about its life cycle. And I'm gonna give some resources for that step in just a couple of slides. The second step is knowing that those pests are present, you can make decisions about how to break those life cycles through preventive measures, that first line of defense. So in a parks context, this might include choosing plant species or varieties for bed plantings that are resistant uh, to certain insects or diseases knowing that those might be an issue in your area, timing that planting to avoid pest pressure, and then making sure to stay on top of weeding and mulching and pruning 
and other routine maintenance and sort of early detection and rapid response to infestations with difficult weeds. The steps are really similar for yards and gardens. So prevention um, and choosing the right plants for the right place. Step three is observation. So that's kind of surveying and monitoring this for weeds. This is staying on top of where populations of difficult or noxious species have cropped up. Um, for insect pests and diseases and weeds, this is uh, a critical step for sort of determining when a pest has exceeded the level that threatens plant health to justify additional actions. And then step four would be intervention when that monitoring shows that a pest has exceeded a threshold. Um, and the key part of the, the action threshold concept uh, is really what happens before you meet a threshold. So it encourages you to tolerate some damage or tolerate some presence of a pest or a weed um, where you might otherwise have wanted to intervene early out of a fear of crop or plant loss. Um, so in yards and gardens, there aren't really economic thresholds in the same way that you might have in a crop setting. Um, so we lean harder on reduction of pesticide use in those cosmetic environments. And so that's step, that brings us to step five, which is evaluation and planning. So sort of in your downtime, figuring out what worked and what didn't um, in, your, in your plantings or uh, in your garden, figuring out why uh, based on looking at um, extension resources, talking to people, thinking about it and, um, and consulting. So you can kind of continually refine your approach to things to figure out what's really gonna work for your conditions and for the species that you're dealing with. So coming back to step one, so figuring out knowing what you have uh, to manage pests and diseases, you really need to know life cycles and habitat needs before you can make any decisions about management. And there are lots of resources, both online and offline, that could help with identification. So a quick internet search with the description of the insect or the damage to the affected plant can be a good start. But I will say, um, just like everything else on the internet, it's good to be cautious about over-interpreting based on some initial search results. So for more personalized information, there's some good places to contact like your, your local university cooperative extension office, master gardener hotline or plant diagnostic laboratory, which could offer the advice that's more tailored to your area. Um, the Oregon Department of Agriculture has a reporting form um, that you can submit uh, photos to and an ODA entomologist will contact you with a response, which is really helpful. In general, these days, a smartphone with a camera is a great tool for figuring out ID of different things. Um, another great online insect resource, if you have a photo, is bugguide.net, which has an active community of insect experts that provide photo identification. So lots of, lots of great tools online. And then on plant ID, if you want to pick up an identification book based on a dichotomous key, which is where you can actually key plants out based on their characteristics. Uh, something like Weeds of the West, uh, you know, pick up a full guidebook it can be really handy for getting all the way down and making sure you have the right species. So I can't give you all of the answers today, but I did want to make you aware of some of those tools and resources that you can take, you can, you know, use to look these up on your own. Um, and what else I have on the screen here is the, the Pacific Northwest Pest Management Handbook, which you can download and use offline, or you can use as a reference online as well for uh, all kinds of different management practices and um, figuring out more information about the life cycle of different common Pacific Northwest pests and weeds. So very good resource online. So a lot of you here today probably deal mainly with weed management, not insect pests. Um, and I did wanna mention that integrated weed management is uh, a different name with the same principles as integrated pest management. Um, 
it's the same sort of principles and framework, monitoring and surveying for noxious weeds, taking a prevention first uh, approach, and then using multiple control methods that account for the safety of your crew, the environmental impact, and all different kinds of uh, other constraints. Um, and then uh, like IPM, integrated weed management can be most effective when you have access to education and training resources, um, hopefully like the one that you're attending today. So in terms of the prevention first uh, approach for managing weeds, limiting disturbance, especially disturbances that create bare ground uh, is a good first start. Replanting and reseeding after disturbance that does create bare soil with species that are ripe for that area. Preventing movement of weed seeds from one property to another. So cleaning of equipment and shoes and clothing, limiting off-leash dogs in areas that have public access if you're concerned about weed seed movement. Um, using weed-free soil and materials to avoid introducing additional weed seeds. And then of course, ongoing monitoring to help nip infestations of weeds in the bud. So early detection followed by a rapid response. And that just means smaller patches, smaller crews, less soil damage and um, less need for replacement plants. So my mom always used to say a stitch in time saves nine. And so early detection and rapid responses um, is a good example of that for weeds. When we look at integrating different strategies, these include cultural and mechanical strategies like establishing desirable and competitive plants in areas where weeds are likely to compete, perennial native grasses and other competitive native vegetation can help keep invasive species out of parks and open space. Um, in turf, this might mean overseeding with high quality seed to maintain healthy stands of grass. So those are sort of preventive cultural strategies and then after weeds have established mechanical strategies like hand pulling and digging, mowing, flower head removal and tilling are all potential options for the management of weeds. But what works for you is gonna depend on what weeds you're dealing with. Coming back to that first step of identifying and knowing the life cycle of, uh, of what you're dealing with. Are, do you have summer annuals like crabgrass, purslane, winter annuals like annual bluegrass or chickweed, simple perennials that spread by seed like dandelion or broadleaf plantain, um, or creeping perennials that are really difficult because they not only reproduce by seed but also above or below ground stems like quackgrass and nutsedge. Some of these, the first three are more easy to deal with with cultural and mechanical options. Uh, the creeping perennials can really pose some challenges. Um, it also depends on the scale at which you're working and what you have for equipment and materials and labor. It's pretty easy for me to go ahead and hand pull weeds and use some mulch to keep my flower beds in order in my small yard, but that does get trickier the more acreage that you're dealing with. But the more that you can do at any scale to prevent weeds from emerging in the first place and to rapidly respond to small infestations, the less need that you're gonna to have to do for cleanup of difficult mature weeds with herbicides. Um, I'm not talking a huge amount about biological control today, but I did wanna mention that, um, there, that insects and bacteria and fungi and other living organisms can contribute to control of weeds. Um, there are lots of different forms of biological control, but in this context, the most common is sort of classic biological control or the introduction or reintroduction of natural enemy organisms to help control an invasive species. And these biological control agents are typically introduced from the native range of the invasive species and they're screened for their host specificity um, before they are introduced or are they only feeding on the target plant or do they have a wide diet. Um, there have been some disasters in the past introducing these kinds of natural enemy species that they thought only fed on one thing, but in fact enjoyed 
dining on a variety of things uh, aside from the attendant pest. So these do uh, require a, a pretty detailed regulatory process now. But once they are established and the introduction release has happened, they can become part of the system for managing these noxious weeds. So the example in this photo is of purple loosestrife beetles. So I'm sure you are familiar with purple loosestrife. It's all over the country, but it's a wetland plant that spreads with prolific seed production and a web of dense roots. And it can completely change the ecology of wetlands, overtaking native aquatic plants, lowering diversity. And because it's aquatic, there's more limited options for, for different kinds of control. Um, this is where biological control comes in. So there's actually four different European beetles that were approved for release back in the 1990s. There's two leaf beetles, a flower feeding weevil, and a root feeding weevil. And those releases have been made in about a dozen states to help control this population of, of purple loosestrife. So these beetles don't actually typically eradicate loosestrife loose strife stands, but they can keep those from spreading. Um, and, and they help, they help with, um, you know, without, if we didn't have the beetles present, um, purple loosestrife might require, you know, multiple herbicide applications in sensitive wetland habitats. So this has been a really useful tool in this context for, for helping manage this particular species. But okay, I've talked a lot to this point about sort of broadly different non-chemical strategies. Um, in a prevention-based IPM framework, a farmer or a city parks manager would only be applying pesticides, chemical control, the top of that pyramid as a last resort when preventive measures are inadequate, when they're not working or not feasible. And the pest is at uh, a level that's threatening economic objectives or ecological integrity. Um, so the goal of all of that prevention-based framework is to save on costs in the end and to prevent unnecessary ecological damage by reducing those chemical inputs. But it's unrealistic to think that we are going to eliminate all pesticide use, especially when herbicides in particular can be the only effective strategy for managing certain noxious and really difficult weeds. So what we also have to be talking and thinking about are mitigation strategies that are reducing both sides of that risk equation that Sharon talked about. So toxicity and exposure of pesticides for pollinators to help protect pollinators from the effects of these chemicals. So where pesticides are used, we're trying to mitigate risk to pollinators by reducing both toxicity and exposure of the chemicals used. So what that means is avoiding use of highly toxic pesticides and high risk scenarios, treating only the area that's needed to reduce that exposure. For example, by using spot sprays, or other targeted application methods, and then taking all possible steps to uh, avoid, minim you know, to minimize offsite movement of pesticides, to not apply pesticides to, or allow them to drift onto flowering habitat that's used by pollinators and a variety of other wildlife. So avoiding high risk scenarios means avoiding exposing pollinators to pesticides and particularly highly toxic pesticides. So how are pollinators like to, likely to be exposed? Sharon went through some of those different routes of exposure, um, but just a you know, big picture one is when pesticides are used in or near flowering habitat, or when even when contaminated plants are transplanted into restorations or gardens. Um, and I know I'm showing you a picture of a very pretty pollinator habitat here, but flowering weeds are also commonly visited by pollinators and we should be thinking about exposure scenarios there as well. So some examples of high risk uh, pesticide scenarios in an urban environment would be something like use of highly toxic systemic insecticides like neonicotinoids, as well as some others for grub control in lawns. 
as perimeter drenches around houses for termite control or as trunk injection or soil drench applications to flowering trees and shrubs. So when they're applied to the soil, these water soluble systemics are, they rarely stay put exactly where they've been applied. They can be very mobile and find themselves being taken up by nearby flowering plants where they can be eaten by caterpillars or they could be ingested in pollen and nectar by bees and other flower visitors. And most bees nest in the soil. So insecticides that are applied for grub control in lawns and turf can find their way into bee nests below ground, contaminating the nest materials of developing larvae. These systemics are, uh, and these insecticides are commonly used in nursery production of plants. So it is really important if you are um, transplanting uh, into a restoration or a garden to double check with your plant suppliers or your nurse nursery provider to make sure that any plants that you are using haven't been treated with a B toxic systemic insecticide. Uh, and I did wanna just put a plug in that we have a fact sheet coming out soon on nursery practices and buying bee safe plants um, in February. So do stay tuned for that. That's gonna have a nice checklist of all different kinds of practices that you can ask your nursery about. So what we're really asking you to do here is put yourself in the bee's shoes. Where might a bee pick up the residue of whatever you're applying? Is it on flowers, is it on leaves in their nest? And what steps could you take to minimize that exposure for bees and other beneficials in your environment? So one of the key ways you can uh, mitigate some of that exposure is simply to reduce the area treated or to use application methods that are more targeted. So this might mean using spot treatments or cut stem and basal bark treatments of, of herbicides in particular, wick wipes on individual plants or small areas um, instead of these broadcast sprays. The less drift that we create and the less chemical we use, the less likely we're creating a hazard for pollinators. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of um, specific examples uh, towards the end about how we can take this approach and use it for a couple of different species that you might or might not be dealing with. Um, thinking again about the risk equation, so it's both exposure um, or the dose as well as toxicity. So we just talked about exposure. How can you reduce toxicity? So let's, let's talk about some resources. There's a variety of resources that can help you compare the relative toxicity of different pesticides to bees, at least in a very broad way, like low toxicity, moderate toxicity, and high toxicity. So Pacific Northwest Extension has a publication called How to Reduce Bee Poisoning from Pesticides, which it has a hard copy version, but also a mobile app that can help you look at the toxicity ratings of different pesticides. But actually the easiest tool that I found for online uh, for comparing toxicity of pesticides to pollinators is called the Bee Precaution Pesticide Ratings Tool that you can Google. Um, that's managed by the University of California IPM Center. And you can see that on the right here. It has drop down menus of different pesticides by trade name or active ingredient and tells you the broad classification, low, moderate, or high toxicity, and whether the pesticide is known to interact with other chemicals. Um, you can add several that you're considering to the compare tool, which might help you select a less toxic chemical for the same purpose. It doesn't have absolutely everything. Um, so you may need to look around a little bit um, to be able to compare toxicity, but a lot, you know, most of the common pesticides are in this tool and it can be really helpful for, for comparative purposes. Um, Sharon also mentioned some synergy of different chemicals uh, and Cornell University published a guide uh, in 2019 on pesticide decision-making in um, landscape ornamental and turf management for protecting pollinators. And that has uh, the most comprehensive table that I know of looking at how different pesticides interact uh, 
and whether they're likely to increase the toxicity of other chemicals to pollinators when two are applied together. So these are all three resources that are available to you with a good Google search. Um, and I hope that you'll find them helpful if you're trying to compare different options. Okay, so we've talked about exposure, we've talked about toxicity. Now I thought we would talk through a couple of examples of different pests and how we might approach their management while protecting pollinators. So the first step for any insect disease or weed, of course, is to identify it and learn about its biology. So let's start with an insect pest. Um, and I've chosen a couple of examples here that are in the Pacific Northwest, are in Oregon, but are also common in other areas of the country if you are tuning in um, from elsewhere. So I thought I'd start with the European chafer, which is a beetle that is spreading in the Pacific Northwest. Um, you may not have encountered it yet, but it's on its way most likely. It can be a pest in lawns and turf. Um, and, and it feeds on grass roots while in its larval phase, the grub phase, killing the grass and leaving these visible dead patches. Most of that damage occurs in the spring, just before those uh, grubs pupate, uh, which is that transition from grub to adult. In the summertime, the adult beetles swarm around sunset to reproduce, and then they, they lay eggs and start the cycle all over again. Those adults don't eat or bite or sting. So it's really just the grubs that, that do any kind of damage that we notice. You can also see, um, you, know, you might also see damage from small mammals that dig into lawns and turf to eat the grubs because they are a handy source of protein. So there are effective chemical tools for these grubs, but the common ones um, recommended to kill those early grubs are neonicotinoids including imidacloprid, dimethoxam, and clothianidin, um, as well as a couple of others, um, carbaryl and the diamide insecticide chlorantronilaprol. So the, the neonics and carbaryl are highly toxic to bees and other beneficial insects. And there are some concerns with the diamide insecticides, which are systemic as well and can make their way into nearby plants. So, a lot of the chemical options for grub control are relatively high risk for pollinators. But the good news is, at least for this pest, non-chemical management seems to be pretty effective for keeping chafer beetle populations in check. So it's been around for a while in the Midwest and Northeast, so there's been a fair amount of research out of there for how you can manage the uh, chafer beetle without chemicals. And researchers have found that it can generally be kept below damaging levels by taking steps to build the health of the grass and make the soil conditions less hospitable for egg laying by those adult females in the middle of the summer. So the, the three main recommendations that have come out of that work is uh, are to mow high. So raise your mower height to the high setting, three inches or more. Um, Homeowners, you know, really seem to like to have their mower set pretty low, like they're out, you know, on a putting green, but setting the mower higher promotes denser grass stands, um, and that makes the turf less hospitable to egg laying of grubs. The second management step is um, just to make sure that the grass has adequate nutrients, so modest fertilizer, and then frequent irrigation. So that's the third step. Um, during the egg laying period in midsummer, usually around late July, or sorry, late June, early July. And then as well as any time you hit kind of a dry period. So irrigation also seems to make turf less attractive for egg laying as females don't like to lay eggs into really moist soil conditions. Um, so that's, that's the preventive management, um, but that's, this is where that IPM framework comes in. If you follow those preventive steps, hopefully you keep everything at a below damaging level and the grub population under control, but you still do wanna keep an eye out if you know that this pest is present. Um, you scout for you know, grubs in the fall, September and October. Um, and if you know that they've been a problem, you can dig up a little foot by foot uh, section of sod and flip it over and look for grubs underneath the sod 
Um, and there's some existing thresholds for knowing where you're probably going to hit damage um, in both low maintenance and high maintenance turf. So low maintenance is something like fescue. And if you find uh, five to 10 grubs per square foot, that might be a damage threshold that would benefit from an insecticide application. Um, below that damage threshold, you're not going to see any benefit of an insecticide application. So this is kind of your example for an IPM approach for an emerging insect pest. You know what you have, you monitor for it, you implement preventive practices, keep the, heart, the turf as healthy as possible and better able to sustain itself and hopefully keep that pest below the threshold for chemical control. Okay. So then I have a couple of examples since many of you are actually focused on weed management, not insect management. So I thought here's a couple of, um, of examples of how you can mitigate the risks of uh, that weed management to pollinators. As Sharon mentioned, we know relatively little about the effects of herbicides on pollinators, but some can have uh, impacts on bees, butterflies, and other beneficials, including impacts on growth and development, changes in gut microbiome, resulting in a reduced ability to fight off pathogens. So while we recognize that herbicides are an important tool for managing natural areas and other spaces, uh, we do take a cautious approach um, and we, we like to do what we can to minimize how much bees and other beneficial insects might be exposed to. So here's our first example of a weed giant hogweed, which is a class A noxious weed in Oregon. It is a perennial that reaches 15 feet tall. It grows in both urban and rural areas. It's not super widely distributed in Oregon. It's most common around Portland and the Willamette Valley. Um, but I bet you'd notice if you spotted it, it's an unusual plant. And here's a person for scale. So in sun, giant hogweed has uh, its sap that contacts skin. Uh, can cause blistering and scarring. So it is. it can be a difficult plant to remove. Um, I will say you, you don't need a Tyvek suit for it, but long sleeves and pants and work gloves are definitely recommended. And the thing about hogweed is like so many flowering weeds, its flowers are attractive to pollinators. So we need to be aware of how we manage it. If herbicides are gonna be used when the plant is in bloom, pollinators are likely to take it up in the nectar in the couple of days before the plant fully responds to that herbicide. Uh, for early or small infestations of giant hogweed, you can dig it out, but later on digging can be a real job as every part of the plant can, can um, lead to blistering on the skin and mowing and tilling are largely ineffective at preventing spread. So larger and more mature infestations of giant hogweed may need chemical control. But how can we do that without harming pollinators? And the key with this species, as well as others that are prolific seed producers and uh, attractive to pollinators, is to get ahead of management before they set seeds. So there's, there's sort of a two for one answer in management, which is, Clipping flowering umbels, as seen in this photo, does the dual job of reducing seed production, um, which helps prevent spread, but it also reduces the exposure risk for pollinators if you want to also apply herbicides to the plants when they're in the flowering stage. So clip back the umbels to stop seed production, then apply herbicides to kill the existing plants. Um, that's, that's sort of a, a dual whammy that um, works not just for giant hogweed, but as well as, as some other plants that where, as you go look at the recommendations, they say apply at the flowering stage. Um, so I'll give you another example of that, which uh, more of you are likely to recognize, which is this other blooming noxious weeds that is attractive to pollinators, um, Japanese knotweed. And that's more common in all of Western Oregon. It's also found in some places in Eastern Oregon. There are several knotweeds in the Pacific Northwest, including Japanese knotweed, giant knotweed, Himalayan knotweed, and all of these plants are incredible, vigorous species that are very notoriously difficult to deal with. They have 
extensive creeping root systems, they sprout and grow vigorously. And from a pollinator perspective, again, management is challenging because the flowers are very attractive to bees. Um, so herbicide use will ideally need to be planned around the bloom period or considered. You can pursue mechanical only management with this species, but not easily. Cutting is generally ineffective unless you're committed to cutting twice a month or more through the entire growing season. Um, all of the resources on this species put twice a month or more in all caps for mowing, just so you have a good sense of, uh, of how important it is to stay on top of it if you are attempting a mowing regime. Because if you, if you put too long of an interval between mowing, it's only going to prolong the infestation and might not even stop the spread. So successful patch eradication usually takes um, more than one year and potentially some integration of herbicides. So the recommended treatment that you will see for this species most commonly is foliar applications at flower bud stage. But in many cases, the plants can be, you know, eight or 10 feet tall at that time in the season. And not to mention that applying at that flowering stage means exposing pollinators to herbicide through the pollen and nectar for several days after application until it fully sets in. So in this case, again, with Japanese knotweed, digging can be effective for early and small infestations, but for larger infestations, um, we would most likely be looking at mowing back before applying herbicide to reduce seed production and also pollinator exposure. So similar to the giant hogweed. Um, I have also seen stem injection or cut stem applications suggested as a method for more targeted application of herbicide, but I should note that you can pretty quickly exceed the maximum labeled rate per acre of an herbicide when you're doing stem injection on a plant that, like this that has a lot of stems per acre. Um, one other non-chemical intervention that I did want to mention, if you are dealing with this plant, it's being tested in a couple of different places uh, with somewhat mixed success, but there's some optimism there, is hardware cloth or metal mesh that's fastened to the ground to prevent knotweed development. It seems to be most effective if it's left in place for more than a year and continually managed to make sure that knotweed hasn't just pushed it off the ground. Um, but I did want to offer some hope that there could be some more integrated solutions for this very challenging, very vigorous, impressive plant um, that isn't solely reliable on herbicides. So they're implementing this metal mesh in our, in our local water authority um, here. I live in Connecticut and we have this plant too. So um, just wanted to mention that there's some, some other options that are being looked at. All right, so those were a few couple specific examples. I wish I could go into more, but I can't deal with specifics on every single plant. But what I wanted to do was just kind of jog your brain a little bit on the species that you're dealing with and how you might use your knowledge of their biology to get a step or two ahead of their management, as well as how you can reduce toxicity and exposure of pesticides for pollinators as you manage different kinds of pests and weeds so I'd like to end today by pulling together and summarizing the concepts we've talked about and giving them a little visual. So this is our three-legged stool that can help jog your memory about this down the road. So this three-legged stool is just another way to sort of summarize how we think about uh, pest management for pollinators. And each leg provides an important contribution to the overall stability of this framework. So starting on the left, the first leg is prevention, preventing pests through non-chemical management. Um, so we, you know, we're really wanting to see big systems change when it comes to pesticide use for reasons that I hope were pretty clear after Sharon's talk. How do we reduce the use of pesticides? By implementing practices that address the root of pest issues um, without chemical management. So approaches that reduce plant stress and break pest and disease cycles. The second leg of the, school, the stool is justified use. So this is about becoming 
intimately familiar with the insects and diseases present in your landscape in your parks through scouting and monitoring. Uh, this is contributing stability back to that first leg of preventive practices, making more informed decisions, um, both about prevention, but also about when it might be appropriate to use a chemical to treat an infestation. So instead of applying a pesticide, as soon as you see a bug, ideally you can use science-based thresholds to tolerate a certain level of damage. And then the third leg of the stool is for those pests that defy preventive management and move above tolerable levels. And this is where uh, if you're going to apply a pesticide, taking steps to mitigate or reduce the risk to pollinators and other beneficial insects and their habitat. So all of these pieces together form a balanced approach that allows some flexibility for meeting folks where they are in terms of their practices but also to guide, uh, guide all of us towards bigger, bigger picture systems change around pesticide use. So hopefully you can keep this three-legged stool in mind as you do your best to manage pests while preventing uh, any exposure and toxicity risks to pollinators. So I'll end with just a couple of different resources um, as you turn to your own issues and your own pests, things that can help. Um, if you haven't explored these already, the NOFA, Northeast Organic Farming Association Organic Land Care Program is a great resource for sustainable ecological landscaping that promotes and enhances biodiversity, biological cycles, and soil activity, uh, which is its certification program based on minimal use of offsite inputs. Um, EcoPro is another certification program for sustainable landscaping and has extensive resources as part of its certification program on best practices for lawn care. Oregon TILF used to offer an organic land care certification, it no longer does, but their uh, online resources are still up. So that, um, that may be helpful to you if you're just looking for some information. And then for those of you in Oregon that are concerned about invasive weeds, if you aren't already aware of or in touch with your local cooperative weed management area, that's a good place to start. These are partnerships of organizations and agencies and nonprofits dedicated to combating invasive weeds in their respective regions. There's a few around Oregon. Um, so they'll have up-to-date local information on invasive plants and their management and offer some coordination. If you're interested in digging in more about pesticides and pollinators, we have a lot of resources on our website, xerces.org, ranging from publications diving into the impacts of different kinds of pesticides. We have one on organic pesticides, fungicide impacts on pollinators, how neonics affect bees, um, and then fact sheets that are sort of more how-to recommendations about protecting pollinators at home, on, in cities and on college campuses, and then how you can protect habitat from pesticide contamination. And of course, if you go on our website and you've looked through our publication library and you feel like there's a subject that needs more attention or that you can't find info about, please reach out and let us know. We often are writing these guides in response to questions and concerns that are voiced to us. Um, that's where this nursery guidance that's coming out soon came from was just a lot of people asking about how can I find be safe plants at my local nursery? How do I know that my nursery is providing me with a plant that I can put in my yard for pollinators? So please reach out to us and let us know if there's something that you wanna know more about. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Thanks so much for participating today. I hope you learned something and um, that we've been helpful to you. You, Emily and Sharon, that was excellent. Um, we have a few questions that are in the chat that we either didn't get to or we thought we could answer as a group. And so uh, I'm going to direct the first two at Emily, but um, Sharon, you might have additional um, pieces to add as well. And let me just read them to you. I'll start. I'll just give you one. I've heard you can use myo dish soap uh, mixtures or vinegar water for, for fungicides and killing grasses. 
what is recommended for natural chemicals? So this is a tricky one because uh, I often see sort of homemade pesticide mixtures recommended on, you know, Facebook gardening groups or sort of natural forums. Um, but those kind of dish soap, Epsom salt um, mixtures can be um, more risky than, than you might expect because there's no label rate. Um, the, they're not formulated for use on plants or outdoors. So um, they can be more toxic than you might think to uh, non-target insects. Um, you know, something like the dish soap and, and or, an, or vinegar, if you're using it in a, in a space that really has very little um, exposure risk for pollinators, like you're spraying, you know, a couple of things that are in your sidewalk cracks, I could see that um, being a possible solution there. But I, I really can't recommend using um, sort of home formulated uh, ingredient mixtures in your gardens for uh, just for the reason that they're, they're really not intended for that purpose. Um, and they can be more risky to pollinators than, than you might think or than they might say on your, your local gardening group forum. Um, I mean, I know you've thought about this as well. Um, if you want to add anything. Oh, I wanted, I did want to mention one thing that I saw one time that I really highly recommend you not do is use something that is, is entirely not to its purpose. Um, I once was looking around at a gardening group and, um, noticed someone mentioned that they used a foot fungus cream to try and treat a fungal issue in their garden. So like imagine using tenactin, um, on your plant ended up, you know, killing the plant. <laughs> and I just really, I want to encourage you all to move away from um, trying to use something that is, is, not, um, is not intended for that purpose um, and really has no safety profile uh, in your gardens. <laughs> so that, that made me kind of drop my jaw a little bit when I saw it in the, uh, in the garden group. Uh, that was, I, you shared that with me. I was, I couldn't even believe it, but I guess, yeah. And yes, thank you. I don't have anything to add, Emily. Um, the other question, which is similar, although uh, is talking about essential oils and it was direct, it was specific to mosquito management. I'm just going to read the full question to you. And we only have about five more minutes and we had a couple other questions. So um, we'll see what we can get to. Some mosquito spraying companies offer treatments labeled as organic or natural that usually contain essential oils like cedar oil. Is there a way we can tell how harmful they are to non-target beneficials like butterflies, moths, caterpillars, native bees? You got it. I, I would encourage you to check out our organic pesticides fact sheet and guidance on um, Xerces.org. That has a, a comparison of um, some of the different essential oils and other sort of labeled organic options. Um, one thing I really would would encourage you to do if you are getting marketing from a backyard mosquito treatment company is to ask them for information about the specific product and active ingredient that you're getting. Um, so for example, my parents have been marketed to by, by backyard mosquito management companies um, as you know, this is gonna be a, a, a green option for managing mosquitoes. It turns out that what they were applying were, was a pyrethroid, which is a synthetic version, sort of a cousin to the um, organic uh, pyrethrins, which are um, sort of more, uh, they'll break down more quickly in sunlight, the organic version. Um, the synthetic version, even though it is a related chemical, it was manufactured to be more persistent and it's more toxic over time to bees and other beneficials. So it is not at all a comparable option. So even though it's being marketed to them as being a green option because it's related to an organic pesticide, it is not itself an organic pesticide. So it is, um, yeah, I would just encourage you to make sure you have asked them for the exact product that they would be using and then look that one up on those um, different tools and resources for toxicity that I talked about earlier, like the bee precaution pesticide rating tool from UC, University of California. 
that will give you a better sense of just how toxic they might be to pollinators. The um, only thing I'll add on mosquito management specifically, you know, uh, the other thing we can think about, especially if it's a backyard that you're dealing with, you know, if you look at, if you think about that, you know, that three-legged stool that Emily showed you, probably the strongest and most important piece when we're dealing with mosquitoes is really trying to, you know, source reduction, getting rid of the places where mosquitoes are breeding. And much way before you decide to be treating in your backyard for, to knock down those mosquitoes, you need to be figuring out where they're coming from and knocking down the sources so that they can't be breeding. And if you can get that in your whole neighborhood, that's even better because they will move from yard to yard. Um, so we, I'm going to try, I'm going to start on, I think, what is a really tough question um, where a few more are popping in and Emily shared, I'm hoping with your expertise, you can help me. Um, there's a question about managing aphids in trees and not wanting to use a systemic insecticide. And I think I'm going to start with that three-legged stool again. Oftentimes aphids are there because a tree can be stressed. And so Kind of identifying the stressors and, uh, and it can help a lot, go a long way to manage those, those aphids before they even get there. So especially if we're talking about street trees or urban trees where they might have soil might be compacted, they're not getting enough, enough water, maybe the, you, know, you have a nutrient issue. Those are things to think about uh, ahead of time. And then don't, not knowing the size of the tree thinking about, can we just knock it down with water? Can we wait for beneficials to be coming in? Because oftentimes you will see, you know, lady beetles and others come in once those aphids hit a certain um, threshold of in order and the lady beetles start noticing that they're there. Um, so think, and also, you know, Emily, I think and Sharon both talked about some pests are nuisance pests, other pests are, you know, actually a threatening the health of that tree. Are those aphids just a nuisance? Do we need to be treating for them? Um, and I haven't given you an answer for what chemical to use, hoping that you don't have to get to that point. But Emily or Sharon, do you have anything to add on that question? Also, um, well, I thought of one other thing. Go Sharon. Uh, okay. <laughs> Well, I'll jump in just to say that there are a lot of natural enemies of aphids that um, uh, like, to, like to eat aphids. And you may find um, that if you allow the problem to resolve on its own, you may find this, that the natural enemies will come in and they will do their work. Um, I will show you really quickly my favorite book. Attracting, it's not a Xerxes book, but Xerxes could have written this because it's the same philosophy, attracting beneficial bugs. This is to your garden, but it will also work in your landscapes. She has some great stories about doing exactly that here. She's a very, very well-trained entomologist who has really looked closely at the interaction between pests and their natural enemies and understands that um, basically attracting natural enemies is really the best approach um, in a landscape to um, approaching uh, pest control. One other thing I will add though, is um, that aphids are often tended by ants and there are certain tapes that you can put uh, uh, like um, sticky stuff called, I'm forgetting what it's called right now. Angle but feet? Yes, that's it. Yeah, and it can prevent ants from moving up and down the trunk of a tree. Um, if you're dealing with a tree, I can't quite remember if it, if it was about a tree, but, and that can be a, um, a method that might help suppress some of the aphid activity as well. We had, a, so it's actually, we are at 1030. Um, Emily and Sharon, are you able to stay a couple more minutes if people want to stay on to answer questions? Yeah. All right. Um, this one, I'm. we might not be able to answer it today. I probably need to dig it up, but question on aluminum phosphide and impact for pollinators. And I think a related question uh, is about gopher problems and impact for pollinators. I, I kind of, I tapped Sharon, but I don't know if she noticed. I don't know, Sharon, do you know much about aluminum phosphide? Do you have an answer? You could also follow up. Um, I, I'm not very really familiar with aluminum phosphide. I know it's highly toxic to people and it's a fumigant, but I really don't know um, more about it beyond that, unfortunately. Sandra, I don't know, maybe you could type in a little bit more about how it's used. 
you know, but um, I, and we might need to move on because I just don't, I don't have much information on it. Well, you know, and um, I didn't either the tip of my yeah. tongue, but I was thinking this as well as the AFID are both great examples of hopefully, you know, some of the resources that Emily May offered, you know, can be, you could go to be precaution by UIPM, type in an aluminum phosphide, see if it comes up, see if there is data on it or not. Might not be there. I'm not sure. I haven't, haven't looked. Um, for, for the aphid one, same thing. What type of tree are you looking at? Type in the tree that you have and maybe you can even identify the type of aphid and figure out what, how to respond to it. There's so many resources available. And the more you know specifically about the pest or the chemical you're looking at, the more you can find. So um, same. So Sandra, that which is if you're aluminum phosphide, check that out on bee precaution. And um, also see if you can find more about that, what tree you're looking at with aphids. Let's see, I think that's really the, all of the questions we have. Wait, wait, here's some more coming in. Sorry, I'm wrong. There's more coming in. Anyone else, Sharon, is there another question that you think you can answer? There's one on diatomaceous earth I'm seeing. Yeah, there's two Emily, questions on diatomaceous earth. Mm -hmm. I earlier sent people, then Emily mentioned it, there in the Q&A, there is a link to our organic fact sheet. Is, is diatomaceous earth in that? I'm not certain. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So you can find that answer there. Um, and here where there's a question about powdery mildew that someone asked for Emily to repeat. Um, oh, how to control powdery mildew. Sometimes you have species, you know, plant species that are just really susceptible to powdery mildew and there's not much you can do. But um, in general, you know, the idea is increased spacing between plants to promote airflow and making sure your plants have good sunlight and the right amount of, of nutrients. Um, but I know that even, even when I've spaced out my bee balm, sometimes I get some powdery mildew on it just because it's so susceptible to it. Um, so sometimes it's about, if that, if that is really bugging you, um, putting a different plant in that space if you um, are finding one that's a little more resistant to powdery mildew. And I will say, you know, I, I mentioned a lot of online resources. Um, if you are dealing with a scenario where you just can't find the answer and you really want to know how you can better protect pollinators um, while managing um, whatever situation you're managing, we are also a resource that you can reach out to. Um, and, and, you know, we love digging in and, and answering questions and trying to, to figure out solutions that are going to work for you and for pollinators. And I just looked up aluminum phosphide on UCIPM and it isn't there. So, and Sandra said she could reconnect with us, which would be great. And then and we can and we can dig up and see what we can find. We're probably not going to find a lot. The first thing I think about is a lot of bumblebees rely on old gopher holes. And um, so it's a, it, you want to be careful to make sure you're not treating an area where you might actually have bumblebees nesting as well. Um, but that's a whole different part of the question. Um, Anything else we want to answer? Sharon, do you see another question we want to make sure we can get to? Um, there's a good question, and, and I may, I'm wondering if you know a little bit more about this, but what is known of the interaction between herbicides and synthetic fertilizers? Could the interaction be increasing toxicity? Um, great question, because we have so many weed and feed products, which are basically a combination of uh, herbicides and um, sometimes, well, fertilizers plus herbicides or sometimes insecticides in some of those products. Um, I may, have you looked into this? I have not. Um, and I'm trying, I'm wondering, oh, Emily, do you have I any? was just gonna say, no, I've, I've looked at herbicide toxicity, but I really haven't seen anything about synergy between fertilizers and herbicides. Um, there, you know, there's synergy between herbicides in some cases and, and other things. Um, but uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that, but that's a really good question. And I wondered about, you know, one of the things when Sharon was talking about half-life as oftentimes how a herbicide acts is dependent upon what kind of soil it's in. Same for any pesticide, right? How, how much it binds to that soil, how fast it breaks down. 
Um, hard to say what would happen with a synthetic fertilizer with those herbicides that very well could change how it's going to act and behave in the environment, maybe making it more or less, more or less toxic, more accessible, more likely to run off or move somewhere. Hard to, yeah, I don't have, one of the things you'll find when you look into pesticides is you have to sit very comfortably with a lot of uncertainty and a lot, because there's so many variables and then you try to interpret the, what you do know to make the best possible and uh, best, best possible decision. And obviously the three of us all work in conservation. So oftentimes we're trying to figure out what risks might be there and how can we minimize the potential for them? And I think that's, it's always a great to ask that question when you can, what risk might be there? How can I, how can I respond to that and minimize that potential risk? All right. Anything else people are seeing as we're scrolling through? I'm, I'm a terrible multitasker, so I'll answer a question that I'll miss other things coming in. There's a question about posting a screenshot of some information on reading labels um, to my pollinators group on Facebook. Do we have um, a policy on that? I don't know. I think our Facebook generally we don't put um, other information from other organizations because we get so many requests. Um, but if you if you can, please send it to us. It might be something that we do at times. I'm a, oh, I'm it's, assuming it's a screenshot from this presentation. Oh, um, one thing oh, I will oh, say. Our work on their Facebook yeah. page. Sounds great. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood that. Okay. Yeah, that seems great. And if you want to mention that it was in the, from this presentation, um, that would be great. If you wait, I know that Rachel is planning to put the information up on the whole video online as well. But that would be great. Thank you. Spread the word. <laughs> and, and that one um, infographic that I included from the Oregon Bee Project can be accessed directly on their site. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you so much. It was great to have everyone here and really excellent questions came in. Uh, I had to do some digging and thinking on my own, which I, I like that. So that was great to, to have that engagement and hopefully we'll see you in another training. Thanks everyone. Thank you.